Hello everyone, this is Tomasz Kratka. Today we're going to talk about Siege Weaponry and Siege Warfare. In this short overview, we're going to discuss and define Siege Warfare and Siege Weaponry. Then we'll discuss various Siege Weaponries employed in medieval times and various uh, conflicts. And we'll discuss finally the historical context and primary sources of Siege Weaponry. And then we'll conclude it all together. So, what is Siege Warfare? The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines siege warfare as the military blockade of a city or fortified place to compel it to surrender. The word siege is actually derived from the word sedere, which is a Latin word that means to sit. And siege warfare and existence, existence in ancient history from the Greeks and Romans as a military tactic, and it dominates history throughout, throughout all of history until the invention of gunpowder and modern-day guns, which eliminated the need for siege. However, in modern day warfare, you still will see siege, siege in a city or a siege in a heavily a military base still be quite effective. So, what exactly is siege warfare? Siege warfare is a long term tactic to deprive a fortified place of resources alongside to demoralize them through the use of siege weaponry. A siege, siege attacks can take weeks, months, years in order to get the fortified place to surrender or to completely crush them in every aspect of the fight. And both sides are heavily invested into the siege itself on the offensive and defensive sides. So here we have some uh, pictures, two pictures of siege weaponry in use alongside siege warfare, in which you have the attacking uh, army's objective is to invade the fortified position through use of some siege weaponry and to gain control of the inside castle or halls, and yet the defensive armies whose job is to stop the invaders from coming out. So, what are siege weaponry? Siege weaponry was uh, large, massive scales of weapons that were used in conducting siege warfare. Uh, they were very resource intensive, and there was a variety of siege weaponry employed during medieval times. And these, and the medieval in medieval times, the armies that were, were quite centered around these siege weaponry. Since siege weaponry were very hard to move due to their massive scale and size, they were very expensive to build and maintain. And finally, but not last, they were very closely guarded military secrets because these siege weapons were very effective. And as a result, armies that had uh, siege weapons would definitely do better against those that don't. So, in this uh, small presentation, we'll talk about five different siege weaponry that were employed, even though there were many more that were employed during medieval times. So we'll talk about battering rams, catapults, trebuchets, ballistas, and siege towers. So, to start off. What are battering rams? Battering rams were used for primarily breaking two gates or to break open walls in a fortified location by using a large uh, long object, most usually it would be a large log. It could be either carried by people or hosted by a contraption that would let the log swing into the uh, wall and use, basically using the power, the forces involved by colliding two objects one could hope to puncture a hole into the wall, which would allow for foot, footmen and knights to inv to start flooding out into the inside of the castle or fortified location itself. Now, battering rams can be quite massive, or it can be handheld. In medieval times, they were very massive, and you can see examples of this in many movies, especially the Lord of the Rings, in which at the def at the uh, defense of Isengard, you see the orcs have a, a large battering ram that they use to uh, breach Isengard. How, and today, in our society, modern day police will actually have their own handheld battering rams to order to punch open doors in hostage situations or in situations which, in which forced entry is required. And battering rams are actually pretty customizable at the time. There are many materials you could put on, onto the ram. You could put steel, pierce, piercing steel, or you could coat the ram itself with water, protection from fire, or you could even build housing up around the ram to protect the ram from uh, enemy archers and people below it. So here we have a picture of a battering ram that is found in France. As you can see here, this is the large ram itself. And what people would do would they would pull the ram back and then use their forces, basically their momentum, sling the ram forward into the wall and do this multiple times so that the wall would finally crumble and break, or at least puncture a hole in it so that people could start coming in. And here we have this uh, defensive structure built around it to help shield it from enemy fire, whether it be enemy fire itself or enemy artillery or whatnot that could potentially be harming the soldiers inside this structure. 
So, now that we talked about battering ramps, let's talk about catapults. Catapults were a ballistic weapon used to launch a projectile over a large distance, and this was done through the use of torque forces, in which uh, the, the catapult would be cranked down into the ready position, and then once you release the the all the you release the lever, or you would hit the hammer, all the torque, all the stored up torque inside the catapult itself would be released, and that would send the projectile flying forward across the battlefield. Now, catapults could launch many projectiles. They could launch rocks, flaming weapons, or even biological weapons such as animals and infected bodies, which would be very uh, critical during long, long siege. And as we can see here in the town hall of Mercado, San Verino in Italy, this is an example of a catapult that would have been used by in the medieval times. So you would have this large uh, catapult piece itself, and this would be cranked down, as you can see in the back, here are little cranks. And here, I guess, I assume would be some rocks that you can put into the bowl here. So what the soldiers would do, they would crank it down all to the bottom until this piece here would be parallel to the ground. And then someone would hit the crank here, or hit some mechanism to let this go. And one let this go, with all the torque energy stored up inside this crank, would be released, and this thing would be sent flying forward really fast. And with all that torque energy moved to the rocks, the rocks would fly across the battlefield, hoping to be effective. Now, with the trebuchets, the trebuchets were the successors of the catapults, and the trebuchets were used to the main siege weapon during the Middle Ages. And the reason for that was the catapults uh, were pretty, were very uh, active and very popular during the Roman Empire, but they fell out of favor because of the fact that trying to use a crank to keep cranking the catapult up was actually pretty slow in compared to what the trebuchets could offer. So the trebuchets were working by the usage of slings to launch projectiles, and there were two two versions of the trebuchets used. They had the traction trebuchets in which you had the people at the, at the weight itself and pulling the the, the sling up, down, so that the sling could fly, fly up and launch a projectile, or you had counterweights, which are basically like very heavy, uh, very heavy boulders or sand or gravel to act as the at the counterbalance. So when so that was released, that would send the projectile flying across. And the thing with trebuchets, they used the same ammunition as catapults, so you still would have your rocks, your flaming objects, and biologic weapons that the trebuchets could launch across battlefields. Now, this is the a German rendition in the 15th century of a very simple uh, trebuchet. So, soldiers would pull this part of the trebuchet the, the, down, and then you have the large counterbalance here, or your counterweight, and then once you let go of the rope, this would fall down fast, and this part would fly up and launch a projectile. And you could think of this as kind of like a uh, seesaw. So using the forces of a seesaw, and you have your fulcrum here, this is how you would achieve great distance with a uh, trebuchet. Now, the next weapon we'll talk about is the ballista, which is a, uh, a large standing projectile weapon used to launch large bolts across battlefields. And you could think of it as the precursor to uh, modern day cannons and modern day guns seen on ships or tanks and whatnot. And this would also propel by torque, torque forces in similar fashion to the catapults. So one would have to crank a ballista in order to use it. And we would, you would see that this is very popular during the fall of the Roman Empire, since the Romans themselves loved to use catapults and ballistas. But as we see in history, it fell out of favor to, to trebuchets, springalds, and crossbows. Springalds and crossbows are other siege weaponry that we I discussed earlier in this presentation. But these are smaller, more effective versions of ballistas because they were easier to handle and easier to aim with. And, and the reason that the ballistas fell out of favor because with the building of very large fortified uh, walls, ballistas can't really penetrate those. They can only penetrate light defensive structures, such as wood or maybe little townhouses that were constructed out of mud or whatnot. And so here we have a video from the video game Witcher 2, in which the main character, and this guy named Gerald and the king, use a ballista to knock down a light defensive structure. And it'll take about a minute to watch it.
So as you can see in the video, the ballista was used to take down the light defensive structure. Oops, excuse me, my bad. By cranking the, the torque, the, the crank itself, and then the king, the king's soldier would use the hammer to release the uh, the bolt, the bow itself, launching the projectile across the battlefield to hit the castle itself. And last but not least, the last uh, siege weaponry we'll talk about are siege towers. Siege towers are very large, massive, tall structures used to protect boarding soldiers and ladders to uh, actually uh, approach the walls and to uh, start fighting over the walls. And these siege towers were actually quite movable as they had wheels to move it and they were able to reach over walls so the soldiers could get on. And they had multiple floors held in soldiers that were connected by ladders. Soldiers could be ranging from regular footmen to knights to archers or later on even involved to include weaponry such as battering rams or cannons or little ballistas itself. And here in this picture we have a uh, English siege tower uh, that was uh, this drawn, drawn by an English author back in the 1800s I believe in which we can see in this battle that we have five five floors for the siege tower so you had archers on the top floor firing onto the defenders of the wall you had your foot soldiers and knights actually traversing the, the boarding plank onto the wall to fight. You had archers down here too. And if we talked about oh, just uh, recently, you could uh, have other siege weapons on board. So, for example, you had the uh, battering ram that was used to punctu punch away at the wall itself. And siege towers were very effective means of actually boarding uh, these boarding these uh, the defensive structures to f either finish the siege or to start fighting within the city itself to finally get the defenders to resign. And so let's look at we're going to take a short look at some historical context of the uh, siege walls siege in which siege weaponry were used. So the siege of Acre in the, during the Crusades, 1189, trebuchets were used by the Englishmen and Frenchmen against Muslim forces at Acre. And then we see in the Siege of Kenningworth, the castle, one siege tower actually had 200 archers and 11 catapults in it to uh, take down a wall, which I think is actually pretty impressive at that time to house this many uh, soldiers and weaponry inside one siege tower. At the fall of Constantinople in 1453, we see that siege towers are actually being burned down by Greek fire, which is uh, it goes to show that these siege towers were actually had some weakness, which were the fact that they were mainly built out of wood, so that they were very susceptible to fire. At the Siege of Stirling Castle in 1304, the English army constructed a giant trebuchet on site to start sieging Stirling Castle, and that they was nicknamed the Dire Wolf. And at the Second Siege of Tyre in 1124, there is a historical mention of tre large amounts of trebuchets in use to siege Tyre. And what's interesting to note in that many of these uh, battles, either recorded or unrecorded battles, you'll see that a lot of these uh, siege weapons were actually constructed on site by engineers. Because of the fact that it would take forever to move the siege weapon, especially uh, weaponry that was uh, that had to be standalone, like ballistas or especially ballistas and the catapults, that it was that you had to build them on site before you could start using them, which led to the reason why siege can take weeks, months, or even years because of all these uh, forces that come into play. So, in conclusion, we talked and defined what was siege warfare and siege weaponry. We talked a little bit about the different types of siege weapons that were used in medieval times, and we had a short little snippet on the usage of siege weapon in uh, many in some battles that we have historical records of. So, I would like to say thank you all for watching my presentation. As you can see here, here are some of my sources that I use. I hope you guys enjoyed the presentation.